And let's begin. Thanks everyone for your patience. I really appreciate it. We are in the middle of the flood story. And as we noted last week, as we've heard in discussions and sermons here at Claremont UCC, we know that there are dozens of flood myths across cultures, including cultures that surprisingly wouldn't have had any communication with each other. And so some of these flood narratives predate the Genesis narrative. And so we could make a comparison between these flood narratives, of course. Um, at the same time, though, what we want to understand is how the ancient Israelites are using the story of Noah's Ark to make theological and spiritual claims about their understanding of God. So we are in directly in the middle of our primeval history here. And we have had the story of God's creation. So God ostensibly has created every part of the cosmos in this seven day period and calls all of creation good, humanity even very good. And so there's this relationship that God wants to have with humanity. God is walking through the gardens and communing with Adam and Eve and something happens to that relationship, that there is disobedience to the dictums that God gives humanity. And so the relationship is wrenched in some way. We find that the God portrayed in these early chapters is a God who acts a lot like humanity, that this God becomes upset, this God becomes jealous, this God's able to change God's mind. God is not static. And so God had said that you would surely die if you ate from this tree, but we wrestled a little bit with the fact that that doesn't necessarily come true, that they're told they will die, but at the same time, they're allowed to continue to flourish. And so God is trying to understand God's own relationship with humanity in this post-fallen world. We have the story of Cain and Abel. Humanity doesn't always live up to the expectations that God sets for humanity. And what will God do in response to that? So we're continuing to ask that question. One little note that we didn't get to last week that is interesting is the word that's used for God looking upon. Let's just go back to it in Genesis 6. So God looks down upon the wickedness of humankind and... Let's find the exact word here. Ah, it grieved God to God's heart. Uh, the word for grief here is the same word that's used for the pain that um, Eve will experience in childbirth through the curse and also the toil that no, uh, that an uh, Adam will experience from working the ground. And so God is experiencing the same emotions that humanity has been cursed with. So God feels those too, and God grieves at the state of humanity. So God decides that humanity is going to be punished, but there is one righteous individual, Noah, who obeys God. And so God decides to save Noah. And where we left off is that the uh, after seven days, the waters of the flood came on the earth. All right. So in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. What does that verse tell you about ancient cosmology? There was water under Yes, exactly. They believed they don't didn't know the water cycle yet. So they believed there was a source of water under the earth and there was a source of water above the earth. So the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah with his sons, Shem and Hem and Jepheth and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons entered the ark. They and every wild animal of every kind and all domestic animals of every kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every bird of every kind. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. 
The waters swelled and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. The waters swelled so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters swelled above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, domestic animals, wild animals, all swarming creatures that swam on the earth, and all human beings. Everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, human beings and animals and creeping things and birds of the air. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. And the water swelled on the earth for 150 days. Okay, perhaps God will respond to any moment of human failure with an act like the flood, completely destroying all of humanity. That is the potential solution being offered here. Questions so far? That's a lot of, that's a lot of things. A lot of days. A lot of days. Yeah, that's a lot of days. That's almost a whole school year. Almost a whole school year. <laughs> When you're a teacher, you measure everything by school days, don't you? <laughs> all right. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and all the domestic animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters gradually receded from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, which is in present day Turkey. And so there have been a lot of archaeological efforts through the years to go into Turkey and try to find the remains of the ark. The waters continue to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains appeared. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent out the raven. And it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent out the dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set its foot. And it returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took it and brought it into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and there was its beak, and there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove and did not return to him anymore. So we have all of our flood narratives, and of course, the one coming from the ancient Near East, the dove would bring back an olive leaf. That's the flora that would be present for this dove. He waited another seven days, sent out the dove, and it did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and saw that the face of the ground was drying. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God said to Noah, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out with his sons and his wife and his son's wives and every animal, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out of the ark by families. Let's read this, read this last part and then discuss. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humans, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever destroy every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. All right. Um, if you're online, feel free to put in the, anything you have in the chat. What do we notice about the promise God makes in verses 20 through 22? Maybe he doesn't believe in free will. Hmm. The inclination of the human heart is evil for me. Mm, interesting. 
So Toby says, it appears as if God doesn't believe in free will. It says the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth. Yeah, very interesting. Other observations? Well, it, it says evil from youth. Uh, it doesn't say infancy. Okay, all right. Uh, Diane points out it doesn't say from birth. It says from youth. Something happens post-birth that humanity is corruptible. But see, I belonged to a Christian organization when I was a youth that was an athletic uh huh. BCL, Boys Christian. And I was taught there that, yes, babies are give, giving away their kisses is sinful, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what Toby's indicating, so Toby said he belonged to an organization, a Christian organization, Boys Christian League, athletic organization that taught that babies were corrupted at birth. That's the concept of original sin. And we, we talked as we've been looking through this early story that we don't really see any indication of the concept of original sin, that humanity is corrupted from the time of birth. But that will, of course, be developed later in Christian history as a major doctrine, one very much part of the Catholic Church. Um, which is why it remains very important within the Catholic tradition to baptize an infant immediately upon birth. In 21, God is making this commitment to never again curse the ground. <clears throat> and then he's got this uh, poetic kind of presentation of that. Some are mentioned in that shall not peace. But he's not asking anything in return, at least not specifically in these verses. Yeah, so maybe it's like a proto covenant, like God sees him as God's side, not necessarily asking anything in return. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this seems to be a covenant that is one sided. So God says, I'll never curse the ground because of humans, and then has, as been noted, this very poetic way to phrase it within the text, but doesn't ask for anything from humanity in return. And as we continue through Genesis, we're going to see several covenants enacted by God. Some of them will have expectations from the rest of humanity. Um, and at the same time, there's going to be conditions that God establishes that even if humanity breaks the expectations established, God's faithfulness will continue. So we have this Noachic covenant, as it's referred to. That is one-sided. So what's the origin stories here? What are the people trying to figure out? As they are analyzing this post-fall world, they're suggesting that while God does have the potential to destroy humanity in response to humanity's failures, their understanding is they worship a God that will unilaterally love them and uphold it's God's own creation regardless of the circumstances on earth that God will not destroy the earth no matter what evil might be in the hearts of humanity so the priestly writer yeah Diane um, except in verse 20 it says no built the altar and um, gave sacrifices I assume that that was meant in Thanksgiving and the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, so there is somewhat of a two-sided. Mm, mm, mm. uh, That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there. Uh, yeah. You could say it was instituted in that case by man rather than God by human Yeah. But, and, yeah. Yeah. Great observations. Uh, it, it does appear that God's covenant is established after Noah gives the offering that is pleasing to God and pointing out that God isn't asking for these sacrifices, but Noah offers them up. Yeah, very good observations. Someone does something like that and they'll do it again. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Bob says sometimes it's, it would be hard to trust someone who would do something so terrible like that. And this is, oh, I promise I won't do it again. Yeah, we've heard that story from people, right? Yeah. The words that stuck out to me way before um, was the idea that God, God remembered 
Noah and the ark after all this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, God had told him what to do, but mm -hmm. closes the door personally for him, and then and then it's still sort of a surprise that God is thinking about him. And I think that's that's part of what it's all about is you know, is God a personal God that knows us? Um, do we have the ability to sway God or is it out of our hands? And there's a lot of evidence with the you know, doing of the sacrifice and so forth that there's some there's something we can do, the being the best sees God. Um, so there's connection and that's sort of the job. Yeah. Surely pointing out at the beginning of the chapter, it says, but God remembered Noah as if God was busy going about God's business and just was eating dinner and thought, oh, my gosh, Noah's still out there. The earth is flooded. We've got to get these guys off the ark. Yeah, there's a um, there's a lot here um, that is as we I'm sure you all have studied other ancient religions, probably particularly Greek and Roman. Um, religious practices, and there's a lot of parallels here of how these very ancient Israelites are um, understanding this text, how they're understanding God, that sacrifices are able to sway God, that God is busy and has to pay attention to humans in order to know what humans are doing. We see a lot of parallels with Greek and Roman mythology. So, you know, and then I, I think of Jesus talking about, you know, not one hair of his head and so forth. So it's such a dramatic change. A dramatic difference between the words of Jesus, surely saying, who says, Jesus, God knows every hair that's on your head doesn't have to remember you. God already knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this text is being compiled during the exile. Um, and so as these writers are putting down these ancient traditions into the final Genesis text, they obviously would have the exile in mind as kind of a, a flood type experience, or even in the midst of the darkness of exile, we're trusting the promises of God that God will not abandon us. Um, you know, as we move through these first eight chapters of Genesis, I, I feel like, um, these are the stories of our initial entrance into the Christian faith. These are the stories we learn in Sunday school. Um, and then we read them closely as adults, and there are so many problems with them. It doesn't communicate the straightforward tenets of our faith that we would presume. We've got a lot of questions. It doesn't make sense. We can see that there's ancient forms of religious practice that don't translate into our modern way we understand God. It doesn't always cohere very nicely with the rest of Scripture. Um, but it's good to just kind of put it in its place that we've got our ancient Israelites. These are their, their first wrestlings with who God is. Were you super bad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would be curious what, and not asking the book right now, but what the, what the original of remember is, because it's ostensibly remember, which is simply the opposite of forgotten. Hmm. It's sort of the hold up to, to Memorial, right? So yeah. It doesn't have to be um, I'm, I'm just struck by a couple of parallels with Genesis 3. So when Absolutely. God says, I'll never curse the ground again, I, when you just read it, I thought, curse the, I wouldn't have thought of the flood as cursing the ground. That seems like a weird way to describe mm. it. I think of Adam's curse, right, in, in Genesis 3. And then also, I was just struck, and again, this could be a translation thing, but it says, you know, the domestic and the wild animal and the, the, well, the creeping things that creep upon the earth. Like that phrase is so long. It's this inordinate attention to the crawling things. And that was that was the serpent's curse. So I, I'm not sure what it's all doing, but it does feel like some of those things are coming back in, in a sort of slightly different form here. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so a couple points. Kevin was saying he'd be curious what the Hebrew translation or how this word functions apart from this passage for remembered, because remember doesn't necessarily have to be the opposite of forgotten, but kind of a lifting up um, or a recognition um, or paying attention to. And then noting parallels to Genesis 3 with a cursing the ground, which is what Adam um, receives as his curse. And then 
so much language being put into every creeping thing that creeps on the earth as a reference to the curse of the serpent. Absolutely. This is very much intended to be a parallel to Genesis 3. Um, God and humanity are trying to figure out what the relationship looks like. This Noah story is kind of a define the relationship moment for God and humanity. Um, and there's this recognition that there was this major curse that happened. The serpents has been cursed. The ground has been cursed. Adam and Eve have been cursed. Um, and as a result, humanity has responded by continuing to disobey God. But what does that mean for the future? And so the story is trying to say, well, we believe in this God that will not do this again. This God that knows the human heart and yet promises to hold creation, to attempt to heal creation, to be with creation. And so all is not lost. So absolutely parallels to Genesis 3. Genesis 3 in this passage are trying to understand what's next. Is that comforting to anyone? Do you, do you feel like this covenant with Noah is, you like it? Is it comforting? Does it feel good? Does it feel inadequate? Kind of curious your reactions. I like it. I mean, I think that's the process, right? Like you're saying we grew up with certain stories and then we engage them as adults. Well. Okay, you're enjoying the dialogue between the passages. Yeah. Um, trying to understand it in a new context. Yeah. Okay. And then people say they've not even thought of, or they're so formative and helpful. And so I, I think that's what it's about, right? The relationship with scripture that evolves over time. Okay, the progress with relationship with scripture. Yeah. As a person of faith, does this promise, is this promise from God encouraging to you? Like, do you feel like this is a uh, ah, okay, we understand God better moment. Every time you see a rainbow. Every time you see a rainbow, okay, yeah. Where is the rainbow? Yeah. We're, we're about to get to it. Let's let's continue. Because that's important. It's important uh the language that's used. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand what it means in 13. In the six hundred first year. What? Did you my translation that says no one was after Yeah. So yeah, that is very much worded weird, but it is supposed to be an and we're traveling yeah. along with Noah's age throughout the passage. So they were in uh, Noah's supposedly 601 years old. Oh. All right. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. No women. As we said, we can talk about the patriarchy every week. The fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the earth and on every bird of the air, on everything that creeps on the ground and all fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Um, okay, this is very interesting only because... This is going to change with an Israelite law mm -hmm. to where not everything will be clean. Mm -hmm. um, and so the roots of the idea of not eating the blood of a creature are very, very ancient, only because it was understood you don't eat the life force and the blood flowing through a creature is its life force. Um, but then the ancient Israelites are going to develop other laws regarding what is clean and unclean that are going to be influenced by the cultures around them. And then by the time we get to the New Testament, that'll change again when Peter receives this vision that everything is clean. Um, but remember, uh, when we we're going through Acts, the one thing that the Gentiles are told, if they are to be followers of Christ, is uh, one of them, don't eat blood. So that's just going to continue through our whole you know, couple thousand year history here. Okay, every, uh, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Only you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is its blood. For your own life blood, I will surely require a reckoning. From every animal, I will require it. And from human beings, each one for the blood of another, I will require a reckoning for human life. 
um, so much, so much of, of religion is culturally based. Um, I think it's always important to remember that you know, when we go into the sanctuary on Sunday mornings, so much of what we do is culturally influenced from European and early American practices of Christianity. We don't have to worship this way. This is what God requires of us. So much of this is culturally based um, as well as they're forming their religious life. Because we're going to get here this kind of eye for an eye edict. But again, that's going to change. And it's going to change based on culture because there are going to be situations where you don't take an eye for an eye. And it's if an ox gores a slave. Well, you know, a slave's not as important. Um, so if you kill a slave, the uh, requirements for paying for that are a little bit different. Obviously culturally based. Uh, and then that's going to change when Jesus says, you've heard it, it said an eye for an eye, but I tell you, et cetera. Yeah, go ahead, James. You know, like this whole thing reminds me of the relationship between a parent and child, like the whole thing. And I just think about like the early, like Genesis, is like, like you were saying, establishing the relationship. And it's very much like a mother or to an early child. You're just trying to set those boundaries of yes and no and be like this. Mm -hmm. And then as you grow up, it's like things become more, more varied and like you get more of that gray area as you go along. Like you're saying, it's culturally influenced, but I feel like that's like the process of growing up, you know, like our relationship with God. Like yeah. The story of growing up with God. Yeah, yeah. Figuring out that relationship with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. James saying it seems as if there's very much like a parent child relationship, is how they're initially trying to understand it. And we even talked about with, you know, Genesis 1 through 3 that the story of Adam and Eve very much functions as an allegory for coming to our own moral determinism, that we have agency over our decisions apart from this divine parent. And here we have, again, this relationship that does function as a parent. And then that metaphor, it falls flat. You know, um, we talk a lot about, um, you know, the Our Father, of course. We talk a lot about divine parentage. And then you talk to people and they say, you know what, that metaphor doesn't work for me. I had a horrible relationship with my mother or my father. And so I can't call God mother or father. It just doesn't work for me. For some with that experience, it works great. It's, a, it's an opportunity to redeem that term. But any metaphor like that is complicated. All right. So uh, we're getting this eye for an eye edict. Whoever sheds the blood of a human by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image, God made humans. And you, be fruitful, multiply, abound on the earth, and have dominion over it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as, may, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and that shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it. And remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. All right, a lot here to unpack. So humanity is given once again dominion. We talked about that in our earlier creation story about some of the connotations around dominion, how it reflects God's relationship to creation. We're going to be touching on that in the sermon today. This is also the third time when we told be fruitful and multiply, right? Yeah. Uh, you mean the third time in this passage? Oh, uh, meant the third time before Genesis. Oh, yeah. Um, the third, yeah, the third instance with multiple repeti repetitions of that phrase in each instance. Um, 
Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, we unpacked that a couple of weeks ago. Um, as kind of de of a, a divine mandate to flourish. Also thinking about what it means for a community trying to protect itself because it's a smaller community compared to its neighbors. This covenant is made with all of creation, not just humanity. That should pique our observations here. That God is saying this covenant is for the protection of all of creation. You are to have dominion over creation, but my covenant is to protect all of creation. We should also notice that this ties into we're trying to question what remember exactly means, but God is establishing the sign both to remind humanity and to remind God. God wants the reminder as well. Um, it is intentional. What'd you say? Second time remembers come up. We'll see remember throughout the Pentateuch again and again. Um, just this emphasis, an <laughs> emphasis that humanity's humanity in, in particular is forgetful. Um, it's why God instructs them to have regular times in the life of the community in which they reread the laws in their entirety, lest they forget what the laws say. And God, exactly. Yeah, God seems forgetful here too. God's got a lot going on. Um, it is intentional that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, great question. So Dan's question is, uh, what, what are ways in which a church like ours can teach these stories in a Sunday school context so that, and Toby said, you know, these stories stick with you. How can you ensure that they're not stumbling blocks? A lot of people grow up, learn that the Bible is more complicated than they were taught, turns them off, and then it, they have a hard time engaging with the faith as well. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a, um, you know, a trope about collegiate education, uh, particularly around Bible, you go and you take your first Bible class. And uh, so I, I think that's an extremely important responsibility for the church and for clergy, um, not just for kids, um, but for teenagers and adults. Um, you know, in seminary, when I was there, it was a very live discussion. You take a class on the Old Testament and the question is, what of this material do you actually say from the pulpit? Um, do people want, you know, a pulpit lesson about the documentary hypothesis and JDEP or the sources of gender law? Like, is that boring? Is that interesting? I, I think clergy have a responsibility to share as much as possible from the pulpit about these academic things. And, and answering your question, going back to, sorry, I was on a tangent there. Um, going back to children, I think that's a live ongoing conversation that's really hard to answer. And so just kind of spitballing with you on, on how I would suggest a story like Genesis be taught would be, um, you know, there's a, there's a story in the Bible about a man named Noah and Noah brought all the animals of the world onto an ark to protect them from this flood because God loves all creatures. And, you know, um, you could even, I think children are old enough to say, maybe this story happened, maybe it didn't. 
But the story, the point of the story is to teach us that God loves all animals and love all humanity. And the story even says that when we look at a rainbow, that's one way for us to think about God's promises for us. And I'm just kind of spitballing, but. Yeah. But I know I've got a lot of children in the ministry and church life. And it's I know, yeah, remember it particularly related to vacation Bible school. It seemed like the developed programs often come to stories that I believe can be very much something like mm -hmm. for children and for the mature. And yet they have come to a place from vacation Bible school yeah. material. Yeah. And as I you know, as I would teach them, have learned the truth of the end of teaching them. I try to be careful with how I present. I often have altered the material because mm. I didn't know the way it was presented could be, contribute to the loss of faith for a child. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, but not most teachers that work with children yeah. don't have the that level of understanding or feel of faith to adapt material yeah. in a way that would still be faithful but not become hopefully. Yeah. 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 I mean ideally children would move from you know preschool and they go through elementary, Sunday school. Well at the, and then junior high and high school, but we know that for many children beyond fourth, fifth, or sixth grade, that they drop. Mm -hmm. uh, for saying they become involved in other activities and they don't come anymore. So the idea that at high school we're going to help them transition to an adult spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. is, yeah. Yeah, well, to think about mm -hmm. what's happening to the little ones. Absolutely. Absolutely. What a gift to have had you in programs as a teacher when you've been able to adapt. So just to recap some of the um, main points is um, just saying that she was uh, saying vacation Bible schools often will insert these stories that can be stumbling blocks for kids and their faith development and just put them in there wholesale with no context or no ways to adapt them. And so you've been able to recognize that and adapt them, but a lot of teachers aren't equipped that way. And that was a very good point that um, if you're going to wait until high school to kind of shape these adult aspects of someone's faith, they might not get from Sunday school to a youth group context. Yeah. Robin? I, I was just going to say that I think I, I've talked to a few adults who think back on those stories and they don't feel they think God loves humanity. Mm. It's like if God loves humanity so much, how can we only say it's you? Mm. How can we only say it's you? Yeah. So many animals. Yeah. There's so many people Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know the the, the, the the Did you hear the sermon I gave on it a couple months ago? That would probably be more relevant than our discussion last week, even. But um, all that to say, yeah, thank you for that, Robin. Which is talking to adults who say, you know, I look back on these Sunday school stories and. I don't see God's love anywhere in them. Like, why didn't God save all of humanity? Why didn't God save all the creatures? We have these beautiful pictures of, of Noah's Ark, and it's a, still a very popular nursery um, aesthetic to put up all the animals, and yet it's more complicated than that. And, and it's hard for us to say, well, this is the point of it, when it's complicated for us as well. Yeah, absolutely. Toby? Well, to Diane's point, Cardinal Richmond gave me a child till I like age of nine and they were divine for the remainder of my of their lives. And what I find very troubling here is the idea of dominion. And that leads to our current day floods. 
And so through climate change and through the sense that we have dominion over the planet, mm -hmm. and its resources, and the way we direct them, uh, building storm drains instead of letting rivers flow, and et cetera, et cetera. And we're reaping our own flow. Yeah. So I'll be saying we're reaping our own floods because of this concept of dominion, the way that we have harvested and taken advantage of and um, pillaged the earth. Yeah. Um, yeah, Shirley. I, it, to me, this is the second time that we get the message, however, that we are all one. It starts with that in the they populated the entire earth, at least of, theoretically. Mm -hmm. And then here, the whole earth according to this is wiped out and it gets repopulated by this one family. And and so often in the Bible everything is contentious between groups, but it, it does begin with this concept that we are not separate beings but one group. Um, and and it also makes me think of my mom was you know always see the news and be so frustrated say, why doesn't God just get rid of everybody and start again? <laughs> oh <laughs> fascinating. I think that, you know, I think the message is that is the point. Mm -hmm. The solution is not to start fresh, it's that we as people have the responsibility. This isn't God's responsibility. Ah, beautifully said. Um, so here we're going to have conflict, right? Right away. Yeah, yeah right away. Um, so Shirley's saying, you know, we think of, you know, regional or ethnic conflict, and this is a reminder once again that supposedly humanity coming from a single unified source, Adam and Eve, and then now um, Noah and Noah's children. And then that was just so beautifully said, saying, you know, mom watching the news and everything's di in disarray. Why doesn't God just wipe out humanity and start over? Well, here's why not, you know, the promise to Noah. But um, that last thing you said about this, that's not the solution, wiping everything away, God destroying everything is not the solution, and it's not just God's responsibility, it's humanity's responsibility as well. Um, real quick, it is very intentional in this passage that there is war language, the rainbow, um, when we think of bow or a bow and arrow, that is intentional, um, that the bow shape is God laying down the weapons of war or God laying down the means of violence, leaving it in the sky and saying, I will not destroy humanity again. All right, well, we'll continue with the story of Noah next week. Any last comments or thoughts? Okay, well, let me close this in prayer. God, as we study scripture together, we ask that you might be uh, moving within us to help us um, find clues as to who you are through these ancient stories. May we be with um, these people from thousands of years ago attempting to understand who you are and how you relate to us and how you work through the world. And, and we too in 2024 have questions. We want to know you more and we want to live in this world in a way that um, allows it to flourish, that allows your creation um, to be upheld and celebrated and cared for properly. And so we pray for your guidance and for the will um, to care for creation. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Thanks, folks. Thank you. All right. Bye, online friends.